Hey y'all, I'm excited to talk about bats and the Endangered Species Act right before lunch when everybody's hangry. Um, just out of curiosity, show of hands, how many of you guys have had bats come up as an issue when you've wanted to burn? Wow, yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I thought. So hopefully I'm going to try to address some of those issues over the next 20 minutes, but in all honesty, this is a topic that we could probably spend days talking about. Um, but that being said, I always like to start out with, um, oh, there's my objectives. We're going to talk about Federal List of Bats, um, little introduction to the Endangered Species Act, and then we're going to talk about consultation. Um, but I always like to start out talking about the bats because they're cool. Um, where do bats live in the eastern U.S.? Pretty much everywhere. We've got them in caves. So some of our species are cave obligates, which means they live in cave or cave-like structures like mines year round. Some of them are forest dwelling. They're in the caves in the winter and then they move into the forest um, during the spring and summer. And then they just come up in all kinds of really weird places. We've got them roosting in bridges, talus slopes, leaf litter, attics, porches, abandoned mine portals. It seems like every year they come up in a place that we weren't expecting them to show up. Always interesting. Um, so just a little bit about some of the bats we've got in the U.S. So this is the Virginia big-eared bat. Um, you can kind of see the range over there. This is typically a bat that um, is year-round in caves, but it'll also kind of day roost in rock shelters and cliff lines. Um, kind of cool little side note about this bat is it can actually roll up its ears like little ram horns when it has a lot of loud noise so it doesn't have to listen to it. Um, which is super cool. Also, probably the most important thing about this bat is it is my favorite bat, which makes it the best bat. Um, Ozark big-eared bat is another big-eared bat that lives in the Ozarks. Um, gray bat, bat that's a little gray. They really knocked it out of the park with these common names and creativity for the bats. Um, this one, you know, caves mines, um, and then it'll actually, even though most of the time it's in caves in the summer, we actually find it roosting in pretty large groups in bridges in the summer too. Northern long ear bat, so this one's threatened with a 4D rule, and we're going to talk a little bit about 4D rule later. Um, this is also one that typically hibernates in caves in the winter, moves into the forest in the summer, um, except for the coastal plain, and the coastal plain's been kind of crazy. Um, you know, it's kind of a new discovery over there, and they don't have caves in the coastal plain, and so nobody was really sure where they went in the winter, and it seems like maybe they're roosting in trees in the winter there, too. Um, just to give you an idea, Indi or northern long ear bats use a little bit smaller trees than what I'm sure you guys are familiar with is the Indiana bat. So this is just some examples. You can see this really small tree over here that was painted orange. That was actually a deer rub, um, and the northern long ear bats were roosting inside of that. Um, you know, snags, cavities, um, slash pile. They actually think that the bats moved into the slash pile after they were already cut down. So good to know that they weren't in the trees when they were being cut down. Um, this one, you guys probably all know about the Indiana bat. This one is the one that mostly is in caves in the winter. It moves into the forest in the summer. Um, they're pretty particular about the type of trees they like. So peeling bark, crevices, cavity, or not cavity, snags. Um, and they like a little bit bigger trees. There's a lot of other components that go into when they pick a roost tree, solar exposure, um, you know, location to foraging habitat, all that kind of stuff. Um, and they have really high site fidelity, which means they like to go back to the same places year after year after year. Um, so this is just an example of some of the places where the Indiana bat lives. You know, for a lot of years, I think we just assumed that it was a certain kind of tree species that the Indiana bat liked. So it was the shagbark hickories. But really what we're finding out is the species may not matter as much as the characteristics of the roost itself. So that peeling bark that they can get under, um, the list of trees that we have found them in, like species continues to grow. Um, and I don't think if I remember right that anybody was here from Florida. Is that right? Florida also has a bat that lives in the trees. Florida bonneted bat, so basically what that means is nobody in the east is immune. Everybody's got bat issues. Um, and then just to touch on white syndrome, I think, white nose syndrome, I think you guys are pretty familiar with it. Fungus that was discovered in New York in 2006, it 
grows on their muzzles and on their wings, causes them to wake up in the winter. Um, it's really spreading, it's spread a lot. Um, so you can see 2019, this was the most recent map, I think as of you know, the first part of July. So it's into Canada now, it's out west in California. So where we used to have you know, zones that weren't white nose, we don't have that anymore. Um, a lot, of, a lot of declines, particularly in the Northeast. Um, but moving on to the exciting stuff, the Endangered Species Act. Um, the next couple of slides, there's gonna be a lot of words and definitions and terminology, and I don't expect you guys to remember it all, and I'm not gonna read it word for word, but I wanna put it up there so you guys have it for reference, because it's gonna be the kind of stuff that comes up as you guys are having these conversations, um, particularly with your Fish and Wildlife Service partners. So why are we here at all um, with the Endangered Species Act? So section nine basically says take is prohibited. Take means you can't do bad stuff to endangered species on purpose. Um, it's prohibited on all federal, state, and private lands. Um, take a threatened animals is prohibited under section 4D. That's a whole other set of weirdness, so just know that they're also protected. Um, one thing that's important to point out though is the definition of take also includes harm. And they've added harm to also include significant habitat modification. So it's not just going out and like, you know, shooting bats, it's habitat modification as well. Not that anybody shoots bats, but at least you shouldn't. Incidental take, this is the realm where most of you guys are at. This is when take happens, but it's incidental to the activity that you were doing that was otherwise lawful. So my example here, so let's say for you guys, you've got a fire, you're burning, it's a roost tree, that bat flushes the tree during the day and flies right into the mouth of a crow. It was not the intention of your project to feed crows endangered bats. It was incidental to the burn. This actually happens. I have seen it with my own eyes. Crows will rip bats apart. They're evil. Um, so I'm just kidding, if there's crow biologists, they're awesome. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, some other stuff you'll hear, your heroes talk about 7A1. 7A1 is another part of the Endangered Species Act that basically says if you're a federal agency, you're gonna use all your authority to help conserve species. 7A2, said a lot of terminology here. Um, so if you're a federal agency, then you need to make sure that the actions that you're carrying out or funding aren't likely to jeopardize the continued existence of listed species or designated critical habitat. And when we talk about action, that's any discretionary action that's either funded, authorized, or carried out by the Federal Action Agency. So how does the ESA apply to bats and fire? Well, we all know, you know that prescribed fires and managed wildfires, they can play a really important role in restoring forested habitats. That's also where the bats live, um, including several of our listed bat species. So just to, whoo, look at that flow chart. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of the Fish and Wildlife Service and what the, our thought process is when we're going through this. Um, so we say you've got an activity. That activity results in a stressor. Stressor is a pretty new word for the fish and wildlife that we've been throwing around for the last couple of years. That stressor results in an effect on the bats. That effect can either be an adverse effect that leads to incidental take, like I said, bat flying into the crow's mouth, or it can be not likely to adversely affect, which is, means it's either insignificant or discountable. Anything that's not likely to adversely affect, we can handle all of that through informal consultation. It's when you move into the realm of likely to adversely affect that we move in to the formal consultation. And just for reference, discountable means it's extremely unlikely to incur Insignificant means it's gonna happen at a really small scale. So let's talk about the bat dates, because I keep hearing people talk about the bat dates. Can't burn outside of this date. This date is this. Really, all the bat dates are are biology. They tell us when the bats are doing stuff and where. Um, so in the fall, we know that bats are on the landscape. They're close to their hibernacula. It's when they're increasing their fat stores. It's when they're mating, so good times. Um, Spring staging is when they leave the hibernacula and they're migrating to their summer um, maternity sites. In the summer, so this is when the bats are on the forested landscape. For some species like Indiana's and northern longer bats, this is when they're forming maternity colonies. 
Um, some of the males will tend to stay a little closer to the hibernacula. The non volancy period. So this is when the pups are in the trees and they can't fly. So this is when they're the most vulnerable. You know, they, they're, if that tree gets cut down or that tree gets burned up, they can't fly away. And the females are actually more, um, less reluctant, more reluctant. They're not gonna leave um, because they've got the pups in the trees. And then in the winter, that's when they hibernate. So that's what those bat dates mean. Um, they weren't based on anything to do with fire. They were strictly based on the bat biology. So when we talk about some of the stressors that come up pretty commonly with fire management, um, and with that, sometimes we also include tree removal for fire prep because, um, you know, a lot of times when you've got prescribed fire, you've also got tree removal. So we look at things like noise and vibration because that can cause bats to flush roost trees. Um, we look at a loss of roosts. Um, and then we look at heat and smoke. And, of course, these are not all of the stressors. Um, it just depends sometimes on where you are or what the burn plan looks like. And, again, it doesn't mean just because you have these stressors that you're automatically gonna cause incidental take. These are just things that we're looking at. Um, so just to kind of give you an example of how we go through that process. So loss of a roost tree. Well, let's say you got an occupied roost tree, the bats are in the roost, that tree burns up or gets felled because you're cutting a fire line. Well, there's a good chance that some of those bats that are in that tree, they're gonna fly away. They're gonna get eaten by predators. They're really clumsy flyers during the day. It's horrible and uncomfortable to watch. Um, and so they get picked off pretty easily. Um, if you've got non-volant bats in the tree and it gets consumed by fire, or it gets felled, there's a good chance that the bats that are in that tree are gonna die. Um, they don't have anywhere else to go, they can't fly. And then we also look at some of the indirect effects, which is that, you know, for a species like the Indiana bat that's got high site fidelity, when you lose that primary roost tree, they've got to go out and they've got to try to find another one. It's not as simple as I'm just going to move to the next tree over three feet away. And so there's some energy expenditure there. And then you've got to consider that a lot of these bats coming out are already kind of, you know, they're, they've already been impacted by white nose syndrome. You know, they're trying to clear their systems of it when they move onto the landscape in the summer. And so sometimes that extra energy expenditure can be a real significant effect on the species. Um, you can also have colony, colony fragmentation. They've done some work where if the big primary roost tree in the middle of the colony gets cut down, because they've got that site fidelity, the colony fragments, and then when the colony breaks up, you've got some thermoregulation issues, there's decreased foraging efficiency. And so all of those things can kind of lead to some decreased fitness, um, reduce survival, and even uh, reduce reproductive success. Um, so unoccupied roost trees. So even when the bats aren't there, if they're in their caves or wherever in the winter, even if they lose that big primary roost tree sometimes, that can have an adverse effect on the species too, um, just because they come out in the spring, the place that they've always been to looks very different, and so now they're having to move. They're having to find a new place to go. Um, but a lot of times we can put some conservation measures in place to avoid and minimize some of these adverse effects. These are just a very small subsample of what some of those are. Um, timing is a big one. You can avoid burning when the bats are on the landscape. So that's the winter burning. Um, if that's not feasible, then you can avoid burning when the bats are, you know, most vulnerable on the landscape. So avoid burning in June and July. Um, you can limit acreages. So if you're going to have to burn in the spring or you're going to have to burn in the fall, let's not, you know, focus like, well, we're going to burn our whole 3,000 acres in the spring. You know, limit that acreage so that the amount of impact when the species is on the landscape is reduced. Um, and then the other thing is, I, I don't think, um, so caves breathe. Um, so they blow cold air out in the summer and they suck it in in the winter. And so they've actually been able to show where sometimes with prescribed fire, if that smoke, depending on the conditions, it can get sucked into the cave. And so you want to watch and make sure that when you're burning, it's not, conditions aren't right if you're close to a hibernacle, that that smoke's not getting sucked into the cave. Um, it's not just the forest dwelling bats that you have to worry about. Um, you know, some of our non-forest dwelling bats can still be affected by prescribed fire on the landscape. So if there's a lot of heavy smoke, in the evening, that can disrupt their foraging. If they're fire, you know, usually we'd like to think that they're smart enough to when they see a fire, they're gonna fly in the other direction, but it's just something that we have to consider. 
And then for some of ours that forage over water, we gotta worry about like water quality degradation. Um, you know, if there's significant amount of soil or erosion or something like that. Um, so the goal is to implement conservation measures to avoid and minimize adverse effects. Getting to a not likely to adversely affect this idea. But we recognize that that's not always feasible and I promise you formal consultation is not the end of the world. And you can quote me on that, it says so. Um, so just to give you a real world example, so this is Mammoth Cave. So if you guys think you have bat issues, um, all of those circles represent known bat locations just for the Indiana bat. So Mammoth Cave is a hot mess of bats. And we are just wrapping up our programmatic formal consultation with them. Um, some of the conservation measures that they've used, this is some, not all, they're not burning May 1 through July 30th. So that helps them protect pregnant females when they come out of the caves, and it also protects the non volant pups. Um, they're going to do some burning in the spring, April 1st to April 30th, when they've got bats on the landscape. But they've limited that acreage to 200 acres. Same with the fall. They're going to burn in the fall, but they've limited that acreage to 400 acres. Total acreage each year, 1,200. Um, they're not going to burn within 150 feet of a known roost tree. Um, they're not going to burn within a quarter mile of a hibernaculum. And then they're not going to burn when smoke could enter the hibernaculum. So we're giving them incidental take coverage April 1st to April 30th, August 1st through November 15th, and November 16th through March 31st. So whoa, incidental take coverage for winter burning. Yes, we are covering them for incidental take for the loss of primary roost trees in the winter. Um, the reason that we did that is they have a lot of bats on Mammoth Cave. They've got a lot of primary roost trees on Mammoth Cave because this is a big programmatic consultation. They couldn't guarantee that some of those primary roost trees wouldn't get consumed by fire. And so we're gonna go ahead and cover it. That way, if it happens, they're good. The projects don't come to a screeching halt. Um, 40 rule, since I'm running out of time, basically fire and 40 rule. Um, there's not much with fire that isn't covered under the 40 rule. The only thing would be is if you need to cut down trees for any reason within a quarter mile of a hibernaculum, um, that's not covered under the 40 rule. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's a likely to adversely affect. It just means that this blanket rule and our programmatic consultation on the 40 rule doesn't get covered. Um, if there's no federal nexus, so let's just say you're a landowner and you want to do the right thing or you have no federal funding, section nine still applies, but there are ways to do the right thing. Um, the section 10A1B incidental take permit and habitat conservation plan, it's a little complicated. So I would recommend if that's the route you want to go, just talk to your local field office and we'll, we'll work you through that process. Um, all right, so this is to me probably the most important stuff. So even if the long-term outcome has the potential to be beneficial to federally listed bats. If harm occurs to a listed species, even at the individual level, it triggers the need for formal consultation. That is just the nature of the beast, of the Endangered Species Act. We know you're doing great stuff on the landscape, you know, the forest health is gonna improve, but if one bat gets harmed while we're moving towards that process, then it triggers the need for formal consultation. Because of that, I would say bring your partners to the table early and often to discuss the potential for adverse effects and meaningful conservation measures. Um, keep in mind I'm federal government. State governments have a say in what happens with their threatened and endangered species list too. So just because we're okay with it doesn't mean that they're okay with it. So bring everybody to the table early. Um, and you may have to dumb it down a little bit for some of us. I know yesterday you guys were talking about pigs and fire and in my mind, I was thinking barbecue, and I was really hungry, and then finally I asked somebody what it meant. So we are, folks like me are Section 7 specialists. We specialize in consultation, we specialize in the rules and regs. We don't necessarily have specialty in the action that you guys are proposing. I'm one biologist, I do hydropower, I do surface mining, you know, underground mining, prescribed fire, timber harvest, and so, the more information you can come with us to um, and explain what you're trying to do, what the overall outcome is, the better it's going to be. Um, incident incidental take matters, so don't cause it if you can avoid it. 
And then also trying to keep in mind that where you are matters. So if you're working somewhere like in the Northeast where the bat population has just been decimated by white nose syndrome, there's less bats on the landscape there. And so those losses may be significant. So just because it works in Kentucky doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work in a state like New York. So you need to be talking to your field offices early. Um, tell them what you wanna do so that there are no hiccups you know, at the last minute. And so the big thing is, I think you know, the biggest issue with this is it's gonna take a little time and it takes a little work up front. But I think if you can do that, then it's going to end up saving you significant time and provide you with more flexibility on how you can burn and when you can burn in the future. Um, that's my little disclaimer down there that those are just my thoughts and may not necessarily represent the uh, universal across Fish and Wildlife Service. They're just so for those of you that work in different regions, so I'm Region 4. I did send my talk to Region 3 and Region 5 to make sure that they were all on board with what's being said. And we're all, you know, like I said, we've got differences based on region, but we're all pretty much on the same page. Um, this is my feel good slide. We can do this. It's going to take pre-planning, open communication, but I think, you know, we can work with effective wildfire programs and the ESA and get it so you guys are on the ground doing what you need to be doing, but also have the ESA coverage that you need. And that's it. Questions? I know that is a lot to digest in a small amount of time. Um.